If one person was the god of game programming, who would you guess? Maybe an indie dev like Notch or Eric Barone? Maybe someone who created crazy technology like John Carmack or Romero. My vote is probably someone who would never even cross your mind. A game with complex systems, crazy performance, and even a custom coded physics engine built with a programming language most would never even touch. His game sold close to 10 million copies and then he vanished into thin air. This programmer was Chris Sawyer and the game was Roller Coaster Tycoon, a name which will trigger flashbacks if you were born before 1995. Whether that's you or not, we're going to take a nostalgic look at this title, its development history, and the things that make Chris Sawyer a game programming legend, which make him a serious contender for the title of God of Game Programming. If you're younger than 30, let me tell you the backstory of this game. Basically, it was the original budget indie game. The, like those games you get in the Steam sale for $5 or less, and you get hours of entertainment out of. Back in 1999, those games came literally in a cereal box. Roller Coaster Tycoon was one of the cereal box bangers, along with Battleship, the Captain Crunch game, and even Age of Empires. In my case, I got it on a burned disc from my friend. Now, as a kid in the early 2000s, you'd get this disc, put it in your computer and boot the game up. And you'd be met with a home screen with dozens of guests walking around, twisting roller coasters, and all this would be displayed on your old school computer with flawless performance. If you've never played, the game lets you build and manage theme parks on different maps, aka scenarios, and each map has its own set of challenges, such as getting a good park rating, a certain number of guests in your park, or a certain number of dollars in your bank account. You start with pretty much a blank canvas with a few guests walking into just a dead end path and the rest is up for you to build. Guests will follow the path you build around your park. You have to spend your money to build rides connected to the path and the rides will generate you revenue to build more rides. So you're basically managing this economy. Now, as your park grows, you can have hundreds of guests in it at a time. And each guest, when you click on them, has kind of their own personality. Some don't like going on scary rides. Some have more money than others. Some get bored over time. And you have to build an entertaining enough park to keep them entertained and spending money. You can build a bunch of different kinds of rides, such as water rides, throw rides, calm rides, different food stalls and bathrooms. And you can customize everything with different colors and music. And there's also a coaster builder that allows you to build as crazy of a coaster as you want with different pieces. You then test the roller coaster and the game generates a rating for it, which is how fun and how intense it is. Beyond this, you can hire employees for your park where either fix rides, clean up, keep security or do entertainment. You do advertising for your park. You can terraform your park, expand it by buying more land. And if this sounds like a crazy amount of features, it is. While it wasn't designed as an educational game, this is an extremely valuable introduction to engineering, economics, and budgeting for kids. But being a sandbox game, there's also limitless complexity and creativity that can go into it so it's also very fun for adults. The art style, which is a mix of rendered and hand-drawn assets, is isometric style, meaning it's a grid tilted on a 90 degree axis, being 2D yet giving a 3D effect. And this art style holds up very well even today. And people still play it today because it's quite a relaxing and nostalgic experience. All these factors came together and made RCT Roller Coaster Tycoon the number one selling game of 99 when it was released and the number two selling game of 2000 only being beat by The Sims. Now, Chris Sawyer, the man himself, he coded this game alone. And this was before being an indie game developer was cool like it is today. The reason it was able to be so complex and also perform on the worst computers is because he wrote it in the language assembly. But we'll get into that after just a few words on Sawyer's backstory because it is interesting. So let's next talk about how Chris Sawyer was able to do this, build a game with better performance that was also more successful than games with teams of hundreds of developers at the time. Well, like many famous programmers, he started his career as a teenager coding on an old school Memtech computer. He used this computer to code a game called Quogo, which had very primitive graphics, but was in that same isometric style. Sawyer had to use assembly for this game because if he didn't, it would simply be way too slow. It had to be painstakingly loaded into the memory with specific instructions. After Quogo, he coded half a dozen other games in both isometric and 2D styles that had a similar aesthetic to the Atari games of the time. From 88 to 93, he went on to code another half a dozen games hired by companies to port the games from the Atari to the PC. And he was writing all of these games in assembly, so he's getting a lot of practice. All this set him up to release his first major venture as a solo developer, only employing some freelance help from a music composer, 
and a freelance graphic designer to create the music and the sprites for the game. This first game was a management simulation game called Transport Tycoon. He got the inspiration from Sid Meier's Railroad Tycoon and combined that with his signature isometric style. This game is a clear predecessor to Roller Coaster Tycoon. You can immediately see the similarities. He said he worked up to 16 hours a day on this project before releasing it in 1994 to pretty good success, but in reality, it was more of a cult following. After the game's relative success, he started working on a Transport Tycoon sequel. But when traveling with the funds he earned from the original game, he had another idea which led him to put this on hold. As Eurogamer said, Sawyer was plotting Transport Tycoon, but fell in love with Roller Coaster, so he started working on Roller Coaster Tycoon, which was then released in 99. Originally, though, the game was called White Knuckle. And in addition to all the features and systems we mentioned earlier, the game also included a complex physics engine that was not in Transport Tycoon. Depending on inclines, coasters would slow down, speed up, or even crash, and realistically fly off of unfinished tracks. This is what allowed for the coaster builder in the game to work so well. For such a massive undertaking, Chris Sawyer's passion for coasters and the Lego-like nature of the game had to be real. And this was apparent in his interview with Hero Gamer. As he said, he's always been interested in the design, the look, and the engineering of coasters, and the game evolved into a full theme park simulator over time. And, and its main focus is just being fun to play, which it definitely is. Sawyer was immediately made a legend, and the game was a smash hit on release. But Sawyer would release two more games before completely disappearing. Next, RCT2, which basically built on everything from the original game, but some criticized it as being too similar and more like an expansion pack, though most still consider RCT2 the peak of the series. He would also go on to release Transport Tycoon 2, which gave a different name, Locomotion, and he'd do this in 2004, but the problem by that point in time is hardware was getting better and better, so, so games written in C were actually becoming quite performant, and graphics were also getting better and better. So in other words, writing games directly in assembly was not as much of an advantage as it was before, but Locomotion was still quite well received by fans of the original title. After releasing four successful games back to back, Chris Sawyer started to distance himself from game development. In his own words, RCT2 was pretty much the full realization of his vision, and since it felt complete, he didn't have inspiration to continue working on it, so he thought it made sense to step back and let someone continue carrying the torch. Atari took over the development of Roller Coaster Tycoon 3, and Sawyer didn't try to impose himself on the new vision. While RCT3 wasn't a bad game by any means, it had 3D graphics, and many felt it didn't preserve the spirit of the original two games. And unfortunately, the series would continue to decline with freemium games, microtransactions, and some downright weird releases. And if you're curious, Zoo Tycoon was made by a completely different developer. In 2005, Sawyer would also sue Atari for not paying him his full royalties, and this case would take three years to settle. Now, obviously there was a big cultural impact, but let's talk for a moment why Chris was actually a programming legend. And that all centers around his use of the x86 low-level programming language. Now, most programmers stay far away from x86 because it is not human readable at all. You are literally telling the computer memory addresses of where to move data. To quote Peter Han, you have to know exactly how the hardware you're running on works, especially the CPU and the registers, because you have to manually shift things around your RAM. Look, assembly is literally most programmers nightmare, so why would you use it? Well, because you're able to precisely move things around, it is much more performant than any other language. It's also, as a research engineer at Google DeepMind said, important for compilers, OS kernel development, and embedded systems. Now you have to understand, in 1999, a lot of games were written in assembly, but very few of these were written by one person. And there's a reason for that, because a single line of C, which is a relatively low level, human readable coding language, well, one line of C can balloon out to four or five lines of assembly because you're doing so many manual steps. This means when comparing lines of code in the two languages, the assembly line growth is exponential. As you can see, these three lines of C turn into eight lines of assembly. But when I add a simple loop, that brings me to six lines of C and 16 lines of assembly. The other challenge with assembly is you basically have to keep everything in your head. C has descriptive variable names and a lot of quality of life features for programmers that helps you read and understand the code and assembly doesn't have any of that. So this means Chris had to have basically the whole game of assembly code mapped out in his head. That is all the systems, all the physics, everything. Rendering hundreds of guests moving around the park at the same time with dozens of rides. And he was able to do this on bad computers with zero lag or slowdown and absolutely 
zero bugs. As software engineer Steve Baker explained, once the game went gold, it was fixed in ROM forever. No patches, no updates, no bug fix. Now just compare that to today's games, which are released in an unfinished state with tons of bugs that have to get patched later on, and this can easily be done over the internet, but that was not the case back then. Bear in mind that modern programmers who get the title of best game programmer, they had the luxury of using C, if not full gaming engines like Unity. They often had full teams working with or under them to work on features, quality control, and testing. And importantly, there were able to push updates to the game if they didn't release it in a perfect state. Chris Sawyer had none of these. So what is RCT's legacy today? So after he released those two games and made his bag, Chris went underground for quite a while, at least until his business manager brought him back to work on ports of the original two games, two mobile devices. These were released as a new game called RCT Classic, and Chris stated that porting the original code from assembly language over to something mobile optimized was no easy task. Though he hasn't been opinionated about the new IPs, Chris's only request was the original two games stayed free of microtransactions and stayed at a fair price. Chris was asked if he'd ever consider releasing a new game, and he stated he'd never rule it out, but it was unlikely, especially considering he's getting older and wants to chill a bit more than he did in the past. The series has also been kept alive by YouTube creators like Marcel Voss and open source communities such as OpenRCT2, which is an open source community that builds on the pinnacle game of the series. And due to the fact that the game has aged very well, its legacy lives on. Now, even though Chris Sawyer's actual tenure of releasing hit games was pretty short, you can't discount all the years that led up to it, as well as the time and impact when this game was released. When you were 10 years old and your PC could not run any other games, Roller Coaster Tycoon was there for you. As a final word, I'll say this. In addition to his impressive technical accomplishments, not just all the systems, writing things in assembly, creating the physics engine, and having a completely bug-free game, the most inspiring part of all is probably Chris Sawyer's humbleness, which is kind of a lost art in the era of self-promotion, but he was a true artist that let the art speak for itself and didn't cling on to fame until his downfall, as many people do, but gracefully stepped back. This, along with all the other reasons, is what makes him the god of game programming. See you in the next one for more tech stories.